One of the most important concepts in biology, or characteristics of life, is the ability of an organism to reproduce itself. And so you could definitely say that evolutionary biology has worked very hard to ensure that we have the proper anatomy and physiology to effectively make more humans. And then we just come in and try to lay the smack down on all that hard work with birth control. Now I do say that a little tongue in cheek, but I say it to kind of give us this perspective that we're trying to stop or control one of the most important physiological processes in biology. And so it's no wonder that birth control can be a little tricky and come with some side effects. So is there a best type of birth control? Well today, we're going to compare some of the most common birth control methods for males and females, discuss how they work, talk about some of the pros and cons of each, and see if we can come up with a winner for the best type of birth control. It's going to be a contraceptive one. So let's get into this anatomical and physiological awesomeness. Now one thing we're going to do after we learn about how these contraceptive methods work is discuss their effectiveness, meaning how effective they are at preventing pregnancy. And we'll do this by kind of putting them in different tiers of effectiveness and then we'll pick the best one. But let's start with the oral contraceptive pill, abbreviated as OCPs, but many just refer to it as the pill. And part of the reason we want to start with the pill is because once we understand how oral contraceptives work, we can apply some of these mechanisms to other contraceptive methods. Now, many of the most commonly used oral contraceptive pills are also referred to as combined oral contraceptives because they contain both estrogen and progestin. And progestin is just a synthetic version of progesterone. And these primarily work by suppressing ovulation. And ovulation is when the ovary, which is this structure that you can see here, releases an egg. And ovulation occurs about once a month. But how these combined oral contraceptives suppress ovulation is by suppressing the release of a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which is this structure that you can see here in the center of the brain. And this is important because when gonadotropin releasing hormone is released, it normally tells the pituitary gland to secrete luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone into the bloodstream. And these two hormones will travel through the blood all the way down to the ovaries and pretty much tell the ovaries, hey, it's time to get those eggs ready. And if you look at this chart, you can see the surge in both luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone just before day 14. Now, follicle stimulating hormone does not stimulate your hair follicles to grow more hair. I only say that because I've had students wonder that. No judgment, it's an honest mistake, because who knew that you had these little bag-like structures inside the ovaries called ovarian follicles. And an ovarian follicle contains the egg, also known as an ovum. And follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the development of a certain number of these follicles each month. But one follicle develops more than the others. And eventually this follicle will release the egg. And this release of the egg, or ovulation, is triggered by luteinizing hormone. So follicle stimulating hormone prepares the follicle, luteinizing hormone causes the release of the egg from that follicle. Now again, these combined oral contraceptive pills inhibit this process at the top by inhibiting the initial release of that gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And both the progestin and the estrogen in the combined oral contraceptives work synergistically together to accomplish this. But the estrogen seems to have a greater influence on suppressing follicle stimulating hormone and thus prevents the development of that follicle in the first place, which is likely the most important mechanism of how these combined pills function. But you can also think of the progestin component as adding a few more layers of security. The progestin changes the inside lining of the uterus, which you can see where my probe is here, and that's known as the endometrium. And it makes the endometrium less suitable for a fertilized egg to implant. It also thickens cervical mucus, which will make it tougher for sperm to swim through. And it also impairs the motility or the smooth muscle contractions within the uterine tubes, also known as the fallopian tubes. And you can see one of those fallopian tubes right here that I'm pitching with the probe kind of embedded in that tissue. And sperm cells rely on the contractions of these uterine tubes to propel them closer to an egg. So if you also interfere with that, it makes it even more difficult to fertilize that egg. So now that we have learned how the combined oral contraceptives work, we can apply this to other contraceptive methods. For example, the contraceptive patch works in the same way as it contains both estrogen and progestin. 
but it is delivered through the skin by wearing a patch for weeks at a time. This can also be applied to vaginal rings that also use the estrogen-progestin combo, but these hormones are going to be delivered through the vaginal wall, and a female would keep the ring inside for three weeks and then remove it for menstruation, and then replace it or reuse it after menstruation, depending on the ring. And remember those extra levels of security created by progestin, where it would change the endometrial lining, thicken the cervical mucus, and inhibit the motility of the uterine tubes. These extra levels of security are so effective that there are some oral contraceptive pills that are progestin-only pills. And there are also other contraceptive methods that also rely solely on progestin. Maybe you've heard of implants like the Nexplanon that are implanted subdermally just below the skin on the inner aspect of the upper arm. This works through this progestin-only mechanism and can last up to three years. Injectables such as the Depo-Provera, which is often referred to as the Depo shot, this also is a progestin-only contraceptive and can last up to three months. Now, I do think it is important to mention that yes, these progestin-only methods have a major effect on the cervical mucus and inhibit uterine tube motility. But at certain doses, these progestin-only methods can also inhibit follicular development and ovulation. But let's talk about another popular contraceptive method, IUDs, which stands for intrauterine device. These little devices are placed inside the uterus and they come in two main types, hormonal and copper. So how do they prevent pregnancy? Well, for starters, both types create an environment in the uterus that's hostile to sperm due to what you could think of as a foreign body effect that is induced by the frame of the IUD. When the uterus is exposed to a foreign body, a sterilizing inflammatory reaction occurs and the uterus produces peptides and enzymes that are toxic to ova and sperm cells which will inhibit sperm motility, destroy sperm cells, and also causes increased phagocytosis of sperm cells by the white blood cells found in the female reproductive tract. Copper IUDs, as the name implies, are wrapped in copper, further increasing the toxicity to the sperm cells. And the hormonal IUDs release small amounts of progestin, which we already know what that is going to do. It's going to thicken the cervical mucus, change the endometrium, and affect the motility of the uterine tubes. These methods are long lasting, with hormonal IUDs lasting anywhere from three to eight years, and the copper IUD can last up to 10 to 12 years. And then there's good old fashioned surgery, which many will often refer to as one getting their tubes tied. But this really is called a tubal ligation, where they surgically go in and occlude or block the uterine tubes, essentially creating this giant love chasm between the sperm and the egg so that they can never reach each other ever again. Now, they can also completely remove the uterine tubes called a salpingectomy. And these surgical procedures are thought to be a permanent form of contraception, especially if you completely remove the uterine tubes. But there are cases where it may be possible to reverse a tubal ligation, but the success will depend on the woman's age, type of ligation initially performed, and the health and length of the original tubes. So because of this, clinicians really try to counsel their patients to utilize a different contraceptive method if there's a chance they may want to get pregnant again. Now, something that is important to note here is that none of the contraceptive methods that we've talked about so far help to reduce your risk of acquiring a sexually transmitted infection. And the only contraceptive methods that can reduce your risk of an STI are certain types of barrier methods, specifically a male or female condom. This literally will cover the skin and mucous membranes where these infections could be transmitted through. And they also block sperm cells from moving up the female reproductive tract. Now there are other barrier methods that also block sperm cells, but don't protect against STIs, such as the diaphragm and the sponge. So if you are choosing to have intercourse with a person that you don't know much about, it might be wise to protect yourself against STIs with a male or female condom. Personally, regardless of the contraceptive method, I think you should see the STI status, criminal background results, credit score, pay stubs, and know the favorite color of the person before you decide to have the intercourses with them. I'm kidding, mostly. Now, as I'm sure many of you already know, there aren't as many approved contraceptive methods that are specific to men besides the male condom and a surgical procedure that I'm going to show you on the cadaver in just a second. Now, there are some hormonal birth control methods, such as injections and topical gels, that are being studied for men. But one of the challenges with male versus female hormonal contraception is the release and production differences in their gametes. Females typically only release one ovum once a month-ish, whereas males produce about 3,500 sperm cells per second, which is about 300 million sperm cells per day. 
So as you can see, there's some logistical differences in sperm versus ovum suppression. But an extremely effective form of male contraception is the surgical procedure known as a vasectomy. And here you can see a right testis. And coming off the right testis, we have the spermatic cord. And within the spermatic cord, there's this tube called the ductus deferens, also known as the vas deferens. And during male climax, the vas deferens transports sperm cells from the testes to the urethra within the penis and eventually outside the body. Now during the vasectomy, the surgeon isolates this tube and essentially separates or cuts the tube. And there are various techniques for blocking the ends and some surgeons will even remove a 10 to 15 millimeter segment of the vas deferens, but this is a pretty quick outpatient surgical procedure. And yes, the area can obviously be a little sore after the procedure, but most men do just fine with very few complications. Now this is a procedure that will not interfere with male hormone production or the secretion of those hormones, as the testosterone produced will leave through a different pathway, specifically through testicular vessels that are not affected by this procedure. And the testes still do produce sperm cells, but they just eventually die and degrade and get reabsorbed by surrounding cells in the area. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. What are the most effective forms of contraception? And does this mean we can pick an overall best contraceptive method? Now remember I mentioned we are going to put these into these tiers of effectiveness. And this top tier includes the most effective methods. And you can see this includes the implant under the skin, vasectomy, tubal ligation, and the IUDs. These have a failure rate of less than one pregnancy per 100 women in one year. And part of the reason these are so effective is that after they are placed or the procedure is performed, they are very low maintenance with very little user error. The only real user error that can occur with these, which does contribute to the failure rate, is maybe someone after receiving a vasectomy doesn't wait the recommended two to three months and recommended number of ejaculations prior to having unprotected intercourse, as it takes time and a certain number of ejaculations to clear sperm cells that remain in the male reproductive tract downstream from that procedure or the cutting of the vas deferens. Or maybe an IUD or implant doesn't get replaced within the recommended replacement time frame. But overall, these first tier methods are quite effective. The second tier includes the injectables, pill, patch, and vaginal ring. And as you can see, the failure rate is about four to seven pregnancies per 100 women per year. All of these methods require more personal maintenance than the tier one methods, and so therefore have a greater likelihood of user error. So to help reduce failure rates, one would want to make sure that they get repeat injections on time, take the pill at the same time each day, and keep the ring or patch in place, as well as change them on time. Now, as you can see, the third tier is the least effective. I know, but you know, condoms only work like 97% of the time. What? <laughs> well, they should put that on the box. They do. No, they don't. Well, they should put it in huge block letters. You could break down the individual failure rates of each method in this category, but the overall combined failure rate is more than 13 pregnancies per 100 women in one year. And this is due to the great variability that you can see with the potential for user error. If you don't use condoms, the diaphragm, or the sponge properly, you could make a mistake with the fertility awareness method. And obviously, the withdrawal or pullout method is like a game of ejaculation roulette. Now, it doesn't mean that the birth control methods in this third tier aren't effective at all and that they shouldn't be used, because there definitely are uses for these third tier options. It just means that they aren't as effective at preventing pregnancy when compared to the others, and you need to be more vigilant in using them properly. So what is the best type of contraception? Now, I do have to say that you can ruffle some feathers when picking the best type of contraception, so please keep in mind that there are exceptions to these picks, but you might expect that we'd pick the best type of birth control or contraception to be in tier one, and you'd be right. The vasectomy for males and the IUD for females. The reason for these picks is yes, their effectiveness, but also for most people, they come with the least amount of systemic side effects. With the IUD, the hormones released within the uterus are localized and therefore less hormones make it into the bloodstream as compared to other methods. And so again, this means less systemic effects on a female's natural hormone release. Now this doesn't mean that women haven't had issues with hormonal IUDs, it just means that overall, this is a great option for many. The vasectomy is one of the best overall as it is one of the most effective with very few post-surgical complications and it's relatively inexpensive 
especially if you compare it to the yearly costs of other contraceptive methods. And it doesn't affect hormonal levels. But there is one major issue. It is recommended for people who are fairly certain they don't want to have kids anymore, as this is considered one of the permanent contraceptive methods. Now, I've seen social media posts stating that a vasectomy is 100% reversible, but this is not true. Successful vasectomy reversal has been reported to be anywhere between 50 to 70% if you've averaged it out across all men. And success rates decline with increased time between the initial vasectomy and the reversal procedure. Now there was a large retrospective study that found more promising numbers and it found successful reversal to be as high as 95% in men who underwent a reversal less than three years after their initial vasectomy. That number fell to 71% in men that underwent reversal 15 years after. So again, it seems that regardless of the study, the greater amount of time someone has between initial vasectomy and reversal, the lower the success rate. Now, even though a vasectomy and IUDs made it to the top of our list, there are obviously other good choices for contraception. But this is a very personal decision, where you want to weigh the pros and cons of each method, including potential side effects, and discuss this with your medical provider. And when applicable, may want to also include your partner in crime with this decision. If you are a fan of our channel, my guess is that you enjoy learning. And that is why we have loved partnering with Brilliant as the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is an incredible way to take your learning to the next level, as Brilliant is an interactive online learning platform with thousands of lessons in math, science, data analysis, programming, and even AI. And because many of us are strapped for time, Brilliant's lessons are designed to be uniquely effective. Their first principles approach helps you build understanding from the ground up, creating a strong learning foundation that you can build upon. Each lesson is hands-on and interactive, letting you play with and explore concepts, which like I mentioned, is a method that has been proven to be extremely effective. Brilliant also does an incredible job helping you build critical thinking skills through problem solving and not just blind memorization. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you're also becoming a better thinker. And something I've been diving into a bit lately are Brilliant's lessons on geometry. I went through junior high and high school always being good at math, except for that blasted geometry class. I just struggled, so I'm going back to conquer my nemesis, and so far, it's actually been quite satisfying. Take that, Pythagoras. So, if you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org IHA, or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel, everyone. We'd love it if you like to hit the subscribe or the like button with one of your anatomical digits, and we'll see you soon.